Hey, Internet. Welcome to work. Ooh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hey, Internet. Welcome to Worldview Everlasting, your favorite YouTube addiction. Yo! Hey, and uh, aside from the fact that that was really cool and I'm looking forward to it, and where has this been all my life? A little stretch for time today, so we're going to hit right to it. Bam! This week is the fourth Sunday in Advent, something that doesn't always happen every year, although it usually does happen, but even when it does happen, a lot of times you have Christmas landing on like a Monday or a Tuesday or a Wednesday, and so since everyone's getting ready to do so much and they're all going to be coming to church like three times that week anyway, this is the Sunday that often kind of gets forgotten. That's too bad because it's a great text and a great Sunday, historically called Barate Coeli, which is the Latin for the first words of the introit in the historic lectionary series. So just like last week, was Gaudete Sunday. Gaudete, Gaudete, Christus es natus. Rejoice Sunday, which is why you got the pink <coughs> rose candle. Ex Maria Virgine, Gaudete. This week, Rorate Coeli is best translated as rain down or drop down. Drop down, ye heavens from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open up and bring forth salvation. Which sounds kind of way out there a bit until you mesh it with the text that's actually a point. Luke chapter 1 verses 26 to 38 in which heaven drops down and the earth the daughter of earth prophesied as seed of earth to through this seed save the earth the earth begins to well open up and from this coming down opening up we have the most amazing miracle in the history of the world part one the birth of Jesus yo yo here we go yo here we go yo here we go here we go yo and in the sixth month the sixth month the sixth month after what well here's where Luke has been already telling a bit of a story about this woman who was unable to conceive children named Elizabeth and her husband Zechariah, who very late in life are visited by an angel named Gabriel and told, guess what? Ha ha, you're gonna have a kid. His name's gonna be John and he's gonna be the prophet of the Most High God to go before him to prepare his way. Anyhow, in the sixth month of her pregnancy, which was such an astounding thing that Zechariah actually kind of sasses the angel a bit and gets a, a humorous little curse of quietude until the day of his son's birth. Even so, it's the sixth month of all this quietude and stuff because Elizabeth is with child. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into the city of Galilee named Nazareth. Now, we don't want to spend too much time on this, but notice who's this Gabriel guy? This archangel, one of possibly three archangels. We know of Michael. There's hints about another. We don't really know what his name is for sure and so forth. But Gabriel is the angel of messaging, kind of the spirit's angel, the one who goes forth and brings words whenever God wants words to be sent. As opposed to Michael, Michael doesn't usually go and bring messages, what Michael does is he fights the good fight. He actually is the warrior angel who commands the troops of the king, so to speak. Yo, Gabriel, he appears to a Parthenon, a virgin, or a maiden, or a young woman who has not yet been married. Which, this is kind of one of the liberal favorite things to do is to say, hey, look, see, the word is not really virgin in the technical sense, the scientific sense of the word, and so we can know that the virgin birth of Jesus was just this kind of myth that grew up over the hundreds of years that passed in the dark ages when all the bad people were trying to get power and use religion to do it, yada, yada, yada. But here's the problem. This is a young Jewish girl. And so if she's not married yet, um, there's only one thing this word can mean. And maiden and unmarried young woman means, well, chaste. 
Yo. So this angel shows up to this chaste little Jewish girl out in backwoods Nazareth in the broad county of Galilee. This chaste young maiden who was engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, who just also happens to be of the house and lineage of David. This is huge. Because David, if you don't know, was basically the king of the Jews. I mean, the real one. I, oh, that's not fair. He wasn't the king of the Jews. He was the king of Israel. Jews comes from the word Judites, and that only happens after the exile, which is after the kingdom of Israel gets just demolished by its faithlessness, which invites the enemies to destroy it because God stops protecting them. Even so, King David's throne is the throne. In the history of the world, there's only been like one other throne or two other thrones that even compare, humanly speaking, to David and Solomon's reign. That would be, say, King Nebuchadnezzar, and perhaps one or two of the kingdoms out in ancient China that I don't know too much about, but they tell me they were pretty rock on. Anyhow, size notwithstanding, the rule of David's throne was undiminished. I mean, nothing could touch this kingdom because it was God's kingdom. And the promises surrounding this rule, both in David and in the son who would come from his loins, from God himself, the God who lived in that Ark of the Covenant and actually like showed up and did stuff in history, his promise was that from David's seed on that throne would sit a king to rule the entire world for forever. And ever since David's throne kind of uh, forgot about that and started rejecting that and falling apart and the kingdom started to decline, well, the pious, faithful descendants of Abraham nonetheless believed the promise rather than their own actions and looked forward to that king who would come to save them from themselves, from the world, from sin, death, and the devil. Yo. And so, this angel from God shows up to this little chaste lady named Mary who just happens to be engaged to a man who is of the lineage of David. I mean, man, it's just like a sentence and a half. There's so much there. Her name was Mary. And coming into her, he said, Kyra, which if you're Roman Catholic, gets translated as hail, which means hello, except for that Kyra doesn't mean hail. It means grace. Literally, it's the word more or less for grace. Find grace in my greeting. Be greeted. So maybe a better way to translate it than hail, because hail has this kind of like, I submit to you thing, is just greetings. Although instead of greetings, what they're saying is grace. So if every time I walked up to you, instead of saying hello, I said grace. And I meant like, yo, yo, you're cool. I'm good with you. Blessings on you. Well met. All this stuff. That's what's being said, except for that it's coming back in just a moment, this word group, and it does mean <laughs> grace. In fact, the very next word is grace. Kekaretomene. Now, it looks really big, but if you break it down, it's actually the same root. You can see it. Grace to you. Graced are you. Yeah? See that? Blessed are you. Having been poured out favor upon you, are you. And then the next words, hakurias metasu. The Lord is with you you. Far stretch from Hail Mary, full of grace, blessed are you among women. Although Elizabeth will say, greetings Mary, blessed are you among women. So nothing wrong with that there. But do you see where I'm going with this? Is this about the angel showing up to Mary and saying, I submit to you, Mary, because you are the mother of God and you are the queen of heaven. Or is this about something more like, hey, you sinner waiting piously for the Messiah, grace to you. It's being poured out on you at this very moment. The Lord is your God to bless, to save, to redeem, oh, to give you more good than you've ever imagined possible. Yeah, that's what it's saying. But over these words of grace to her by this shining heavenly crazy being guy, she was confused and she debated within herself what the meaning of this message could be. Understandable. I mean, it's just not an everyday kind of thing. I mean, some people kind of say, you know, oh, in the Bible times there were miracles all over the place and that doesn't happen anymore. So that means it didn't happen then either because it's just not possible. Well, no, not really. I mean, in the Bible times, miracles happened very, very rarely to a very, very select number of people, always directly leading to the birth, death, resurrection of Jesus. I mean, that was the whole point of the miracles, was to get his seed that he would become to the right spot. It wasn't just kind of like this everyday occurrence. Of course, when Jesus was there walking around, it was kind of like, bam, bam, oh, God, you know, but I mean, he was, um, well, we're going to hear who he was in just a moment. So she's confused. And the angel said to her, what angels always say to people when they show up? Because what happens when an angel shows up? You want to fill your pants. Fear not. Fear not, Mary. You have found Karin. Grace. Ho, ho, ho. Normally translated as favor, which again has this horrible connotation that can be like, somehow you've earned it. You have earned the favor of God. But that is not what this word means. You have found undeserved, mercy-filled charity from God. Now, just to be sure about this, I went and did something that I can now do in my new locale, which is walk over to the office over there and get the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, which is this really old, really expensive series of books about this long, which is super in-depth word studies on specific Greek words that hold packed theological content, tracing them from their very beginning in Greek use all the way through their connection to the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, and the Hebrew words connected to that, to the Koine Greek New Testament usage, all trying to pin down, well, what does this word really mean? And there's a ton of information in here on charis, this word grace, because the meaning doesn't 
exactly say stable over time, although without question within the New Testament, especially in the Pauline corpus to which Luke is very closely tied, the meaning is quite, quite clear. It's not really normally to be thought of as favor, as in something you would earn. In Paul, charis is a central concept that clearly expresses his understanding of the salvation event. The linguistic starting point is the sense of making glad by gifts. Grace, to make one glad by a gift. Hmm. And if you import a little bit of the old Hellenistic understanding, that is the Grecian understanding that influenced its use in Koine, which notice Paul and Luke are writing to the who? To the Greeks, yeah? Charis is a fixed term for demonstrations of a ruler's favor in relation to emperor worship. Ha! Ah, so a ruler who is, you know, kind of semi-divine uses Charis when he bestows goodness upon his peoples. Whoa. Grace to you, Mary, you have been graced, for God is with you. Um, that's kind of weird. Fear not, Mary. You have found the bestowal of being made glad by a free gift. And in this, Paul orientates himself not to the question of the nature of God, but to the historical manifestation of salvation in Christ, which is quite literally what's about to happen. So get this, the angels preaching the gospel to her, that grace, free gift, bestowal of favor permanently upon her is coming. And this is not something about her or how cool she is or how holy she is. In fact, just like for you and me, it's coming in the person of Jesus, right? there. Whoa. For behold, you will catch it in the belly. Sulempse and gastre. And you can see the belly part in the gastre, gastrointestinal. Yo, yo. Ha. You will catch it in the belly. Shorthand for you will conceive in the womb. And you will bring forth a son. A son of David? And you will call his name Jesus. Joshua in the Hebrew. Which means the Lord saves. And this one, he will be great. And they will call him the son of the most high. And God will give to him the throne of his father, David. Yo, yo and he will reign, he will rule, he will basaluse, he will kingdom over Jacob. That is Israel, that is the descendants of Abraham. That is those for whom God fights, which is not just the descendants of Abraham by blood, but those who are descended by faith in the promise. Keep it real, Gentiles. He will kingdom over the house of Jacob into the eternity. <laughs> and the kingdom of him, it will not have a telos. Word can normally mean completion, but really you should take that meaning as end here. It's not like it's not gonna be fulfilled because this is a word that means fulfilled and it's a very cool gospel word a lot of times, but here it doesn't mean fulfilled, it means end. So his kingdom will have no end. Joy to the world. I mean, he is preaching the gospel to her. The Messiah is coming, Mary, the son of David for whom you've waited, and he's going to bring an everlasting kingdom, a kingdom of righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. Oh, so most certainly true. And guess what? He's in your stomach right now. Grace to you. You get to believe it. Welcome to Christianity. He goes on, and behold, Elizabeth, your kinswoman, she also has caught in the belly a son, even in her old age. She who they called barren which was a curse, a way of mocking, a very sad, sad thing. Because blessed is the fruit of the womb. Children of your youth, arrows in your quiver. And the Jews knew it. They believed it too. Whoa. She who they called barren. Old woman, six months pregnant, by fruit unexpected. Mary, Mary, chaste and young, you shall be pregnant too with the Son of the Most High. Verse 37, because not it will be impossible concerning God all that which has been spoken. Now this is kind of a weird thing because in the English, the word rhema or word or things that have been spoken doesn't show up, at least in my English standard version. I'm not sure why and maybe someone can like tell me why because I couldn't figure it out this morning. But it's sad because it takes off this edge of things. It just says nothing's impossible for God. Well, yeah, that's kind of important too. But uh, no, the real point is here, nothing that God has said is he not going to follow through on. That is, God is certain about his promises. When his word goes out, it does what it's says it's going to do. It's not like nothing is impossible for God as I can make up whatever I want and expect it to happen. But when God has said this is going to happen, like oh say baptism saves, this is my body, Jesus will rise from the dead, Jesus did rise from the dead, grace to you, your sins are loosed in the name of Christ, you are saved by grace, not by works, all these good things, right? Nothing is impossible concerning the word of God that has been spoken by God to you. And upon this, Mary said, oh, gracious saving faith, behold the servant of the Lord, which means be it to me according to the rhema, the word of you. The angel shows up, preaches her the gospel. She's confused. He preaches some more. She says, yea, yea, it is so. Amen. And the angel went from her. Drop down, O heaven. Open forth, O earth. Yo, yo, the incarnation's about to take place. And even though we're kind of stepping back and stepping forward at the same time, let's push it all together with Gaudete, last Sunday's theme, this coming week's preaching. Christus est natus ex Maria Virginae. Gaudete. Rock on. Whoa. <laughs> Sarus gratiae, hoc quod optabamus, Carmina Letitiae, devotere damus. Gaudete, gaudete, Christus es natus, 
Ex Maria Virgine Gaudete, 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 Christus est natus, Ex Maria Virgine Gaudete. Deus homo factus est, natura mirante, mundus renovatus est, a Christo regnante. Gaudete, Gaudete, Christus est natus, Ex Maria Virgine Gaudete. 